before we get started, click that like button, turn on notifications, give all a huge thumbs up. Good morning, friends. I'm still waking up. <laughs> uh, we've been getting up early. We've had early doctor's appointments. And when I mean early, we've been getting up at 4.30 in the morning. So to try and get to doctors that are um, open. Uh, my husband has some a tooth that needs to be taken care of. So yeah, we've had to go to Loma Linda. Loma Linda is a, um, a really nice place to get things taken care of properly and we've had other dentists in our lives and they have not been as good so we go to the school for dentistry and it's actually really really clean and safe but with COVID everything has changed I'm sure that all of us are going through something a little bit different but very upside down world right now um so it's 291 days since <laughs> my last confession. No, um, by the way, my name is Ina Irby and I'm a mom and I share uh, with you what I'm experiencing as an ex Jehovah's Witness. Uh, and it's been 291 days, like I said, since my last confession. And um, no, you'll hear me, you know, I, I share little tidbits here and there of what I'm going through. Um, I'm coming to terms with death, I think. I think um, how it didn't help that I had a friend who committed suicide. And we, he was much younger. He was probably about my son. If, if I had a son right off when I got married at 23, like ex Jehovah's Witnesses do, we get married super young. I would have had a child about that age. So, yeah, if I had done, if I had gotten married and then had a baby right away. Uh, it really threw me for a loop. I was already kind of a, try, getting in my brain that because Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that this generation will by no means pass away and then the end will come. Well, there were a lot of older people that have died. And, sorry, you're going to hear my kids come in and out. Uh, way before me. And they haven't seen the end of this system of things. So, it's just... A awakening of looking at life a lot differently than what I had. Did I ever really think that the end would come when at my age? Um, I thought it was a lot going to happen a lot earlier. So when I was in high school at 18, that's what I thought around that time. I thought the end would come for sure. I wasn't going to get married. I wasn't going <laughs> to... I wasn't gonna have kids. Yeah, no. So it didn't happen. And then as I aged, I realized, well, wait a minute. I'm sitting at the district conventions and circuit assemblies thinking to myself, Moses didn't have the end come. Daniel didn't have the end come. Uh, John the Baptist didn't have the end come, right? They didn't see the kingdom that Jehovah's Witnesses, these men in Bethel claim that we're living in the last days and surely it's going to come. And Jesus didn't see the end. I mean, he, he didn't get what he... He tried to explain that, too, to the followers at the time, that they weren't going to necessarily get what they wanted, that it was going to take time. So, will I see it? I believe in a kingdom that will never be brought to ruin. I, I, I believe in that kingdom. However, will I see it in my lifetime? I always kind of thought, well, if Daniel and Moses, Moses, Daniel, Jesus, 
these men that were followers of his didn't see it, then I, why would I think I was going to see it? Why would I think I was a better person to see it? They were loyal. They were, they had a lot less failings than I did, these individuals. So I would sit there and think about that. So I'm, you know, I'm realizing that I'm going to die and <laughs> I hope I get to die in my sleep, right? Where it's painless and no, there's no, there's no real struggle to it. That's what I'm hoping, but people die excruciating death. And sometimes, sometimes, and sometimes they take their lives. So I think when my friend died, because he committed suicide, it just threw me for a loop because this isn't, this doesn't happen to young people. This doesn't, these, these things don't happen to them. They're not supposed to die before the parents. And that is what hit hard is that he died so early in his life. And then the crazy making that comes with being one of Jehovah's Witnesses and committing suicide. I know when my father committed suicide and my sister-in-law committed suicide, it was two different, two different circumstances, but still the, everything had to go through the branch. And then when it, the branch who doesn't, who didn't know any of the people involved, they're only going by what the elders know. And then the elders don't really even know your families. Uh, not really. They don't really want to know all the problems. They just want to know a little bit. So that doesn't give you, that doesn't give them enough window into your families. Because they don't really care. Elders don't care. They're just trying to get through the next week in their parts. That's it. Um, it's sad because when you commit suicide as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they put you in categories. And so there's certain categories that they will put you in. And unfortunately, the young man that committed suicide was in a category of he was not showing repentance. So he did not get a regular Kingdom Hall memorial. The friends would all come and pay their respects because he was disfellowshipped. And my father was uh, in good standing in the congregation, but they went up to the branch and the branch still filtered the information that they, my father could not have it in a kingdom hall because I don't even know what their reasoning was exactly. Um, my dad had started smoking and drinking. I don't know if he let the elders know about that or not. He told me before he died. Um, my sister-in-law, she had committed suicide. Sorry, that was the air conditioner. I'll turn it off. <laughs> Hold on. Um, my sister-in-law committed suicide. She had taken her life at, uh, gunnery right it's where they learn how to shoot guns and I think that's a gunnery I don't really know um, it was sad and she happened to have a memorial at the Kingdom Hall and all the friends were then invited now why the branch thought it was okay for her she didn't have she didn't as far as I know, she wasn't smoking or drinking or anything like that. Um, I would imagine that would probably be why she was pro in cons considered in good standing, really good standing. And um, so there's categories. What's sad about all those categories is that when people commit suicide, it's important for everyone to get together and be able to say a proper goodbye because in your brain, it doesn't make sense that somebody would just do that. And it doesn't, it, the, there's, for Jehovah's Witnesses, if you have depression, 
or any sort of emotional issues. Not being able to get your family and have them huddled together with you. You really need a connection. You need to connect. And everybody needs to come together to help the person. And it would be people that love them and care about them, regardless of their Jehovah's Witnesses or not. Uh, Luke, my friend, had an extended family because his family had totally cut him off because he was disfellowshipped at a very young age, mind you, 17. Um, and that mm, compounds being isolated and alone and feeling that loneliness. And especially now with all the problems with COVID, you're dealing with isolation in a whole different form. And this is crazy making for people who already are suffering from stress and from different things that are going on in their head. They really need, even when they don't want it, people around them to watch them and take care of them and love them and show compassion and show patience with them. It takes a lot of patience. Uh, I think that it just kind of hit. It hit me in a way that I'm still trying to come out of it. It's hard when somebody does this because you can't really make sense of it. When my dad did it, I would go over and over and over in my head. What could I have done? What could somebody else have done? What could we have done together? Uh, when my sister-in-law did it, I still didn't understand. You know, the only thing that I could possibly come to terms with that was that she saw my dad do it. And she also had a brother that had done that earlier in her childhood life. So it's consistent in families. It's sad. It's dangerous. You really have to really be careful with yourself when you have it consistently in your family. I worry about myself. I worry about my girls. Because once you have that, it's almost like, well, you know, that person did that. And it was okay for them. And maybe that's the way. And then when you have all these other things that you're waking up to, it compounds it. It makes it even more frightening to live. It's easy to want, it's easy to die, but it's not easy to live. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> so, this is why I do what I do every day. The choice to live is a lot harder than it is to die. And we've had wonderful people that we know of in the entertainment community that have made choices that look like their lives were perfect, but made the choice to die. There's Robin Williams, Anthony Bourdain, Kurt Cobain, these are beautiful people that were individuals that really shared with the human community, with the other humans and we could identify with them in different ways or at least admire their lives from far off and say, I wish, <laughs> I wish I could travel the world, I wish I could eat that, I wish I could be that funny, but it, it doesn't, it's, it's very, very hard to put into perspective why somebody would end their life, especially when it was so beautiful and full of what, I mean, there are no words to what their lives were like compared to, let's say, a mom's life. <laughs> We know it's hard, you know, we are constantly cleaning up and putting things away and doing just, you know, humdrum things. It's not exciting, but very important, very important. I 
feel so bad for the family that are Jehovah's Witnesses, that my friend, his family, because you really don't get a whole lot of positive, healthy responses from the Jehovah's Witness community. And the community in general, because generally people don't really understand why, why, why this happens. And then there's a lot of questions and there are questions that should probably never really be asked. And I noticed that when I was, when I was um, one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they would ask very strange questions. And they also were very, oh, what's the word? They were just not nice. They were just not nice. Some people were just not nice. And these were elders' wives and elders' kids that were not nice. Uh, they were they were very prying. It's because there's no real healthy boundaries as Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't know when to like just. No, that's not a proper question. That's not a. Don't ask. Yeah, so it's it's kind of thrown me, and I'm. I just wanted to share that with you. There's a lot of. Questions that come up with suicide. And as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, uh, I don't think that there's a whole lot of, well, as an ex-Jehovah's Witness that was in the organization when it happened, when suicide happened, there aren't a whole lot of healthy people in that organization to help you to understand it and to encourage a family properly. They don't have the education and the way they treat people when they're disfellowshipped or disassociated, it just compounds the problem of isolation. And there, there's no help for those people. They have to really, they really have to extend themselves to the outside world. I, I heard from a friend that there's, um, in the new district convention, there's a example of a woman, I guess, who was outside and she commits suicide. And um, I guess they, they say that she doesn't have good friends on the outside and only Jehovah's Witnesses would have understood her. Mm, no, no, no. I don't know about that. I, don't, I, I think Lloyd was doing a review on that. And I have to, to tell you that my father was in good standing. You know, he didn't, I, no one knew he had gone back to some old ways. No one really knew that. But you would think that there would be enough closeness in the community. And he just didn't have that closeness. There were no, there were people that just didn't understand and they didn't care. And that was in the Jehovah's Witness community. My sister-in-law was in good standing and she was suffering. And no one could really help her in that community. You have to get outside help because there is no education when it comes to depression. and There's no education uh, when it comes to suicide and depression and mental illness. And yeah, that has to be done on the outside. And you need outside help. You need outsiders to help you, not insiders. Because they'll just say, read your Bible daily and you'll get better. Go to all the meetings and don't forget to go out in service. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to work. 291 days. That's what I'm feeling. It's pretty sad. I wish that my friend wouldn't have done that. I wish that his parents were open to talking to him and answering texts from him. I wish that they could have been more loving to the people that were on the outside and tried to put the puzzle together. Together. Trying to figure out why together instead of it's an us versus them mentality. 
because there are a lot of people that loved my friend from the outside and they needed to know that. They needed to, to see and hear them and that's sad. And that's when you have to put your pride and your belief system and put it in a different place and listen openly with your heart and listen to other people without the us versus them mentality. I'm grateful that I'm out. I'm grateful that I have you. I'm grateful when you share. I'm grateful to know that my friend is not suffering. And I want you to live. I want you to choose life. This is hard for all of us. 291 days and I'm coming to grips with death at 49 years old. I never thought I would die. Now I just hope that if I die, it's peacefully. No excruciating pain. No suffering. <laughs> just go to sleep. Uh, and I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. I don't want to to do something that I would, on a good day, have regretted. <laughs> that makes any sense. Because sometimes we have bad days. We just give us, give ourselves, just give ourselves just a few more minutes. Just a few more minutes. You know, make that phone call. Get out, put your feet in the water. Go and sit in the sand, go and sit in green grass. Go and walk out and sit in the sun for a little bit on the curb with a hot cup of tea and look at your neighbors and knock on a door and say, hey, yeah, you look like whatever, like you just rolled out of bed. <laughs> but, you know, knock on their door and say, hey, you need anything? You want me to take your trash out? I can do that for you just to share a little bit of life with someone else helps. That you're not alone, that you can reach out and that they, somebody will open the door. <laughs> okay, well, I hope this helps you on your healing journey. It's helping me follow your bliss. Be good humans.